Our scripture passage this morning is 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 to 3, verse 10. We're going to focus primarily this morning on chapter 3, 1 to 10, but we're going to pick up the last two verses in chapter 2 as well. And that's on page 856 of the Church Bibles. As you're flipping to the passage in Scripture, on behalf of your pastoral team, I want to thank you sincerely for granting us this past week the blessing, the privilege of attending our district prayer retreat, which was held at Lake Louise. We got to join other pastors and their spouses. About 600 of us gathered together for prayer retreat at Lake Louise, and you granted us the blessing of being a part of that, so we're deeply grateful. Thank you. Pray with me, would you? Father God, in your great mercy, we pray that by your Holy Spirit in these moments that you would be our teacher, that you would take your truth from your word, which is life-giving and unchanging, and impart it to our hearts in a way that would strengthen us and challenge us in Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Children share their DNA with their parents, so it's no surprise the kids look like their mom and dad in some way. But sometimes a child's likeness to a parent is almost scary. Take a couple of these pictures that I've got here. The top left, that's dad as a baby, and that's his son right beside him. The bottom right is mom on the left as an infant, and of course, her daughter. Yes, kids look like their parents, and sometimes they look an awful lot like their parents. But the similarities that a child shares with mom, with dad, goes sometimes even beyond physical looks. For example, I've had people tell me when I'm walking down the street with my boys that from behind our stride, we just all look like we're related. We actually walk kind of the same way. And I will catch my wife every once in a while saying something in a certain way and with a specific gesture and all smile because it's just like her mama. And in so many ways, whether we're younger or older, oftentimes we reflect our parents. And in this passage of Scripture, the Apostle John says that what's true in the physical realm, in a biological sense is also true in the spiritual realm. People who have experienced the grace of God, we've trusted in Jesus by faith, such that by the transforming power of the Spirit of God, we have become sons or daughters of Almighty God. People who really know God through faith in Jesus inevitably look like Dad. In some way, we will reflect the nature of our Father in heaven when we really know God. Now, we won't do that perfectly, and every follower of Christ by faith is a work in progress. But in some way, we reflect our Father in heaven, and how could it be any other way? Because when we're in Christ Jesus by faith again, through God's amazing grace to us, we're daughters sons of the Most High God. So, of course, we're going to look in some way like Dad. And John makes that point back in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 2. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. That's John's way of saying in the last part of that 29th verse, again, that when we really know God through faith in Christ, our lives will in some way reflect the nature, the character of our Father in heaven. And now in verses 1 to 10 of chapter 3, the Apostle John gives us three compelling reasons why as followers of Christ by faith, we reflect the character of Dad. And not only that, in an increasing way, as we grow and live in more and more of his righteousness. To that end, the first thing that John says is this. He says, remember, God the Father loves us. God the Father loves us. Verse 1 of chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. 
The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be is not yet made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Focus on the opening phrase in verse 1 where it says, See what great, and John goes on to say, love the fathers lavished on us. That phrase, see what great, in the original, literally means of what country. In other words, John, as a grandpa in his 90s, sitting back one day, reflecting on the amazing love of God, is just blown out of the water, and essentially he writes something like this. How astonishing of what country in other words how out of this world is the love of God that has been lavished on us to think that we could actually be children of God friends God's love is so amazing that the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31 in verse 3 would say it's everlasting and God's love is unconditional, according to Deuteronomy 7, verse 8, and many other scriptures in the Word of God. God knows all about us. He knows our past, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And His love for us is unchanged. It's lavish. It's overwhelming. It's unconditional. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 3 and verses 18 and 19 adds that God's love is indescribable and incomprehensible. It's so amazing. And that's not all. Friends, God's love is transformational. When we receive God's love into our lives by yielding ourselves in faith to Jesus as the only one who could forgive us and lead our lives, God's love changes us for time and for eternity. What that means, of course, is for every person who is in Christ Jesus by faith, who has been transformed by this powerful, unmerited, undeserved love of God in Christ Jesus, we couldn't help but look by dad and like dad in some way because his love has changed our lives to look like him. I read a story about a Welsh man who was in love with his next door neighbor. She was less inclined in that direction. But nevertheless, he persisted and he would not give up. Once a week for 42 years, he slipped a love letter under her door. It added up to 2,000 184 love letters. He was persistent, and for her part, she was also persistent in not talking at all to the guy. Finally, one day, after 42 years, Romeo summoned the courage to go next door and knock and ask for the lady in the home to be his wife. And to his utter astonishment, she said... Yes! And so they were married and they were both 74 years of age at the time. That is a persistent love. And I reflect on that story. And I think of the love of the Lord our God. It's so persistent. It's so lavish. It's so unconditional. So everlasting. That the love of God doesn't just reach out to us weekly. And I got to say, sending a love letter a week for 42 years, that's a pretty big deal. But God's love is greater than a weekly love. How many days have you been on planet Earth? For me, that's north of 21,000 days. Every one of those days has seen Almighty God reach out to you with his lavish, undeserved, unmerited love. John says that love, when we receive it, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, has amazing and profound impacts in our lives. First of all, as we've already noted, it transforms us. The Spirit of God changes us from the inside out so that we're daughters and sons of God. Not only that, says John, this love is so transformational 
This love of God in Christ Jesus will see us right through this life and through to that day in which we will cross the finish line and enter into the very presence of Jesus in eternity. And in that moment, we'll be like Jesus. We'll be perfect even as he is perfect. And then there's one final impact. John says in the last part of verse 3, think about this love. Reflect on it. Allow this love of God that's changed your life to grab your heart. And you will not only find yourself reflecting the character of God, and again, how could we do anything but? We belong to him. We're his children. That's our identity. Not only will we look like our father in some way, we'll have a desire, a passion, to look more and more like him day after day as we seek him for all we're worth. And John describes that in this way. All who have this hope in him, this hope that comes for time and for eternity by the love of Almighty God, they purify themselves just as he is pure. In a physical sense, in a biological sense, kids look like their parents. They act like their parents. John is arguing the same thing in a spiritual sense here. When we really know God, he says, and we've experienced this love of God, it changes our lives. And we look like dad. Not only that, we have in our hearts a desire to reflect more and more of his amazing character in all the places where our lives unfold. Well, John talks about God the Father who loves us, and he talks second about God the Son who loosed us. God the Son who by his perfect sacrifice set us free. Look at verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared, that's Jesus, so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. In those verses... The Apostle John, eight times, uses the word sin or sinful. And surely that speaks to the pervasive and devastating reality that characterizes all of humanity that marks you and me. We are sinners. We do think and say things that are, as John describes, lawless, in violation of God's righteous and holy laws. Now, the word that John uses here is the common New Testament word for sin. And the words, all eight of them, have the same root. It's the word hamartia, which literally means to miss the mark. To miss the mark. Now, in John's day, in the first century, that word sin, hamartia, was used in different ways. And so, for example, in Greek culture, it was used in this way. And the Greeks loved drama. And so in dramas, in plays, the word sin was used to describe the protagonist in a play who had a fatal character flaw that led to his tragic demise and a crash and burn. That's the way the Greeks used the word sin. The Romans used the same word, and they applied it to archery. And when an archer missed the bullseye, that person sinned. They missed the mark. Both of those takes, both from Greek and from Roman culture, are spiritually informative. Take the Greek angle on the word sin. God's word tells us that we are sinners by nature. We all suffer from a moral curvature of the soul. Something within us that predisposes us to rebellion against God and a wanting to do it our way in violation of God's holy and right laws. This sin nature in us, if it is not brought under the lordship of Jesus Christ, will promote in our lives our destruction. With respect to the Roman use of the word sin. If we 
look at our lives a little introspectively and compare ourselves to Almighty God, even as Romans 3.23 declares, it becomes very evident very quickly that we fall woefully short, we miss the mark, of God's perfect, holy, and righteous character. What it all means is that you and I, we are sinners by nature and sinners by practice. And we are in desperate need of a Savior. Enter our Lord Jesus Christ. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, there was an English painter who lived. He did a number of works that I think are becoming more appreciated in our time. His name was, is Holman Hunt. And one of the paintings that he did was titled The Shadow of Death. And it's this painting. And in Holman Hunt's painting, The Shadow of Death, there's the Lord Jesus in his father's carpentry shop in Nazareth. And he's laid his saw aside for a moment. He's stretching. He's just getting a little bit of a stretch, kind of working the kinks out. But as he stretches, a shadow is cast on the back wall. And on that back wall is also a tool rack so that the silhouette is unmistakably that of a person crucified. In the left foreground then is his mom Mary. And as she kneels in the wood chip, she looks up and she is taken aback. And as a mom, that moment just so grabs her heart. And the artist has conveyed with a painting what the Gospels convey with words. That the cross of Calvary hung over our Lord Jesus Christ from all eternity. Indeed, Jesus was born crucified. He came into this world on mission, on purpose, to give himself as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And his death is absolutely at the heart of his story And Jesus' death is also at the heart of our story. And so John would say in these verses, reflect upon the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all sinners. We're in desperate need of a Savior. We can't help ourselves. We could never merit our forgiveness. We could never earn a relationship with God. But Jesus paid our price, says John. He came into this world, why? To take away our sins. And again, this becomes real and freeing in our lives and forgiving for us. In the mighty name of Jesus, when we simply choose to receive God's gift of grace in Christ by faith. But that's not all, says John. Jesus came into this world, what? Secondly, to destroy the works of the devil. In other words, Jesus came into this world to set the captives, the prisoners, free so that we would find grace and strength and forgiveness in him to live as children of God in a way that reflects in our world something of the glory of our Father in heaven. Again, John would be challenging us this morning to reflect in a profound moment on the price that was paid for our forgiveness and for our freedom. Allow that to grab your heart. That so serious was my sin, so serious was our sin, that it necessitated the once for all perfect sacrifice of King Jesus on the cross of Calvary and his sacrifice was totally sufficient. Reflect on that. And if our lives have been transformed by Christ Jesus, by God's grace through our faith in Christ, then of course we're going to look like Dad. In some way in the lives that we live, we'll be motivated and encouraged and strengthened to reflect the holiness, the righteousness of our Father in some way. We're works in progress again, of course. But as we reflect on the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for us, And by his stripes we have been healed. We'll not only reflect that as that grips our hearts. We will find our hearts stirred with a passion to lean into Jesus more than ever. That our lives might increasingly reflect in the world in which we live. The glory of the Lord Jesus who came at the first Christmas to set his people free.
Well, the passage of Scripture concludes in verses eight, uh, 9 and 10, where the Apostle John says, Thirdly, God the Spirit lives in us. Remember his argument. His argument is that just like kids look like their parents, so we who are daughters and sons of the Most High God, by virtue of his grace to us in Christ Jesus, will in some way reflect the Father. Allow the love of God in that regard to grip you and motivate you. Reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus for you. And again, that will move you to seek more of God and to desire to live more in his righteousness in your daily lives. And now, and now John says, and don't forget that you've got the spirit of the living God within you to empower you to live a life that blesses God and commends his glory to the people that you interact with. Verses 9 and 10. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed, that's the Holy Spirit, remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. If we read those verses, we could get the idea at first glance that John is setting up some kind of impossible standard like true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ live in total sinless perfection. We know that's not what John is saying here because he's dealt with that angle on things a few times already in this letter. And so back in chapter 1 and verse 8, he's already said this. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This verse is not about living in sinless perfection. Think of it this way. A pig and a sheep might fall into the same mud hole. The pig will absolutely love to stay there, to wallow in it with no desire to climb out of the mud, because that's the nature of a pig. The sheep, on the other hand, is a different nature. It might fall into the mud hole, but it's not comfortable there. That's not really its environment. That's not really its world. So it will seek to get out of the mud. Similarly, the person, regardless of what they might claim in terms of knowing God, who falls into the mud, who is living in a world of sin and lawlessness, as John describes it, and disobedience, and has no desire to climb out experiences no pangs of conscience, has no concern to live repentantly, could care less about reflecting God the Father or living in the righteousness of his ways. The person who wallows in the mud in that way, in that mindset, the demonstrating what their nature is. And their nature is a fallen nature. They don't actually know God. The person, however, who's a follower of Jesus by faith, we sometimes fall into the mud. But the Spirit of God brings conviction to us. We know this is not our place. And our hearts are moved to confess and to be restored to fellowship, to intimacy with God. And within our hearts, there is a desire to reflect our Father in heaven with the very lives that we live, to live in righteousness and in holiness. And in so doing, we give demonstration of our nature as well. And it's a new nature reflective of the fact that we've been born again of the Spirit of God by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And how could it be any other way but that we would want to climb out of the mud? Because as John has noted, God has put his seed, his Holy Spirit within us. Even as Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 declares, every genuine follower of Jesus by faith, without exception, is indwelled by the Spirit of God. And that Spirit of God indwelling us generates with us, within us a desire, a desire to live like God and to seek Him and to pursue Him and to increasingly reflect His righteousness. That Spirit of God is within us. So think of it this way. If you're in Christ Jesus by faith, God could not be closer to you than He is right now because He's indwelling you by His Holy Spirit. But while God the Holy Spirit is indwelling every genuine follower of Jesus by faith to generate within us a heart for Jesus, 
a desire to live after God's holy and righteous ways, there's a difference between having the Spirit of God indwelling us and being filled or controlled by the Spirit of God so that we are supernaturally energized and enabled to live in the righteousness of the Lord our God. If you have ever had the opportunity to do, visit uh, southern Ontario and the Niagara Peninsula, and if you've been to Niagara Falls, out in the middle of the Niagara River, you probably saw that barge. That barge has been sitting in the middle of the river. It hasn't moved for 101 years since 1918. That is until this past October 31st. On Halloween night, a big wind whipped up out of the southwest, gale force, with gusts up to 100 kilometers an hour, so that for the first time in a century, that barge was spun around, flipped on its side, and moved downstream. Now they're not sure if it's going to rest there for another century, or if it might go kersploosh over Niagara Falls. What that story reminds us of is the power of the wind. And in the scriptures, the wind is a beautiful metaphor for the power of the Spirit of the living God. Friends, when we are filled with, controlled by the Spirit of God, in our mind, emotions, and will, we experience supernatural strength from God to live in the ways of our Father in heaven. This is God's provision for each and every one of us as followers of Jesus. So how would we, how would I experience the filling of the Spirit of God who is indwelling me by God's mercy to me? How do we live in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit? Four things, simply. First of all, own the command in your own life. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a command. In other words, the provision of the filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives is not for super-Christians or pastors or missionaries. It's for everybody who is a follower of Jesus by faith. We need to own the command that the Spirit of God would fill and control us in our mind, in our emotions, and in our will. Secondly, we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice to God. We need to yield fully, surrender all that we are to King Jesus. That's what Romans 12 verse 1 says. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That yielding, surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives almost always will come with the confession of sin and repentance so that we might be a clean vessel, so that the Spirit of God might fill us fully. Then thirdly, we simply ask for the Spirit of God who is indwelling us to fill and control every part of us and we accept the same by faith. Is it that simple? Friends, it is that simple. How did you become a follower of Jesus by faith to begin with? How did you become a daughter or a son of the Most High God? You made a faith decision to yield your life to King Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. And the Spirit of the living God in that moment took up residence in your life. Now to live in the filling of the Holy Spirit is simply an act of faith again where we surrender to the kingship of our Lord Jesus and ask His Spirit indwelling us to control us in every way and we receive that by faith. So we would pray, Spirit of the living God, take control of my mouth today. Help me to say things to others that will be to them a blessing. Your words, Lord Jesus, through me to them. Take control, Spirit of the living God, of my eyes. Help me to see others in a way that Jesus sees them. Take control of my mind. Spirit of the living God, as I step into this day, help me to think God thoughts. Spirit of the living God, take control of my heart. Help my heart today in a world of scores of distractions to beat after the heart of the Father for other people and for what really matters and take control of my feet and my hands, Spirit of the living God, that I would be divinely enabled, supernaturally empowered to live for God and to serve Him 
and to be Jesus' hands, feet, and voice into the lives of others. We pray this prayer, and then in faith we say, Thank you, Spirit of the living God, for hearing and filling me. And we step into our day. And finally, fourthly, make this a daily practice. Where the first thing that we do when we begin our day is King Jesus. I give this day to you. I yield myself to you in it. Now, Holy Spirit, fill me and control me. Live the amazing life of Christ through me so that I'll look like Dad as I step into today. And that will bring him glory. And I will walk in freedom. And I will be a blessing to the people that you bring me in contact with. Yes, kids, inevitably, in all kinds of ways, look like mom, look like dad, act like them. And so it is for us in a spiritual sense. As children of the Most High God, we look like dad. Allow in that regard the love of God, the overwhelming, lavish love of God for you to grab your heart and to motivate you to desire to look even more like your Father in heaven for his great glory. And think about Jesus, the perfect Son of God, and his sacrifice for you. And again, allow that to grip you and to motivate you to seek him with all your heart, to live in a way that blesses him, and then We say, Spirit of the living God, fill us. Fill your people here at Harvest that we have got power, energy from on high to bring glory to God and blessing to others by living in the power of the Spirit of God within us. Let's pray. Father God, we just marvel. Our minds are blown away this morning. In some sense, like John's was back in the first century, just reflecting on the unbelievable love of God. Here I am. We are regular people, ordinary people. And to think that you would choose, not that we deserve or ever could earn it, to pour out such a lavish love on us. Father God, our hearts are moved. And Lord Jesus, for your perfect sacrifice, to think that while I, we were actually living in rebellion, Father God, you demonstrated your love for us by sending your Son to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins to purchase our freedom. How grateful we are. Again, may those things grab our hearts in this day and motivate us to live our identity as we jump into our world, a new week starting tomorrow morning, and our identity, by your grace, is we are daughters and sons of God. And we get to look like Dad. Grant us grace to that end, and then, Spirit of the living God, thank you for giving us your strength by your filling to do what we've been talking about, which is to live in the righteousness of the Father. Help us to that end, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.